Hey everybody and welcome to the Casually Hardcore Podcast. My name is Brian. Joining me, I'm very happy to welcome me three to the podcast. Uh, it's been a while. You, I don't know if you know this about yourself in this case, but you taught me how to make money originally in Final Fantasy XIV uh, back wow. in the day when before I was doing content creation. Uh, you've been doing it for the, the past six years over on YouTube? Yeah, yeah. So since uh, Around Reborn launched in August 2013 is when I started. Yeah, so uh, we're, today we're going to be talking about content creation, the life of a variety streamer. So you might know me three from his Final Fantasy content, but he does a wide variety of games, a wide variety of content, both on YouTube, but also on Twitch. And we're going to be talking uh, about that, your experience with Twitch as well. So I'm looking forward to kind of getting your insight and perspective. Uh, so we're live here on uh, Twitch right now, but this podcast will also be shown over on YouTube here the following day. You can also check out the audio form of it on Spotify, iTunes, uh, <laughs> SoundCloud, like all the places that podcasts, I guess, can be consumed. Uh, if you guys enjoy either the video or the audio, please make sure you leave us a comment. Let us know what you're you're thinking. I'm I'm really excited. Chris today is on a vacation. He'll be back next week. He's out skiing. This is kind of his yearly thing. We try to kind of play around with the schedule, but it's just going to be me three and me today. Uh, last podcast we had was with Freelancer Codex talking about Anthem and the current state of it is as it is today. But uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and have some fun. Let's dive in uh, into content creation. Me through what what got you started? Because you said you started with ARR, and that's yeah. how I found you. But then like you know, checking out your channel every now and then, it's like you do uh, cover a wide variety of games. That's got to be a a lot of work, and yeah, and hopefully a lot of fun. <laughs> so what what actually made you jump into content creation? Um, originally, what, what it was is that before Final Fantasy XIV, I was playing World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy XI, things like that. And I used to take screenshots of like everything. So like, oh, some interesting achievement has happened, some big world boss event, blah, blah, blah. But then after so many years of doing that, because I played World of Warcraft for something like eight years, I ended up with a folder with like 3,000 screenshots in it. <laughs> so I was just like, so sometimes yeah. it's fun to like browse through. But then I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could actually look through actual HD recorded video mm -hmm. rather than to remember these moments? So that's how I started my YouTube is, is basically like I just wanted it to be like a video log of the gaming. Like I, I didn't get into it with the idea that I'm going to be a full time crafter in 14 or whatever. Mm -hmm. that, that's just something that fell like onto my lap sort of thing as I went along. But um, yeah, so that's really my motivation for doing it was to just make it a video log of my gaming experience online. Okay, so uh, you brought up obviously uh, World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy XI. I think we all share some of that DNA in us. Uh, talk to me first about Final Fantasy XI because yeah. there's a lot of love that people have for that, a lot of nostalgia. WoW Classic just came out uh, six yeah. months ago and it seems that seems to be doing really well. Uh, talk to me about your experience with 11 though like real at, at first like how long did you play it what uh, obviously i think that was a natural ramp into 14 but I'm, I'm curious yeah so um i was in university when i started final fantasy 11 because i had a lot of free time basically <laughs> because i didn't go out to clubs and i don't drink and stuff like that so lots of people go to the student unit so i, I was in my room a lot so i had i had to fill it with time with something and um, I thought, okay, let me try out this game, Final Fantasy XI, because it seems like it's going to occupy a lot of my time. Because obviously I was a student, I was also broke, so I didn't have <laughs> money to just buy every game that came out. So um, I checked out Eleven, and it was really, really different to what I knew about Final Fantasy at that point, because obviously it's very different to Seven, Eight, Nine, Ten. Because mm -hmm. I started with Seven. Yeah. Okay. And, um, then I got into Eleven, and then I was like, wow. I was at first, I was like this is hard man it's like you have to have like a, a like a full group yeah. just to kill like a level 12 mob you know what i mean well so and it's I'll, like and if you want any xp because it's like it could say easy prey and you're like that's not that's not an, that's not an easy prey fight and then you finish yeah, it yeah. off 30 minutes later and you're like 
and 30 experience you're like oh god <laughs> yeah or like because there has that i remember like a time when i spent the whole day looking for a group to go to a farm in valcom dooms mm -hmm. and then um for for a few monsters died we wiped in the group because uh, we had uh you know those bogeys you know those magic oh, yeah mobs. They, they sort of uh, aggroed us and killed us all and I leveled down and then the group disbanded so my entire day was basically just like negative progress I've accomplished nothing I've, I've actually it was it would have been better for me if I didn't even log in yeah so uh, but I, I did absolutely love 11 but then uh, World of Warcraft came along um, like maybe a year or so later after I started and um, I was like Wow, this is a lot easier. I can do everything solo, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I don't need a full group to level up and so on. So then I made the switch over to eleven. But that's the the name I have. So Mifri is obviously obviously after Mifra from Final Fantasy Eleven. So and uh Menafil after Arthas Menafil, the Lich King. Mm -hmm. So I and uh for me fourteen was like almost like the best of both worlds. So that's why I eventually ended up going into fourteen. But I still have I still have love for World of Warcraft though. That's the thing. Yeah. But I did play a little bit of classic, but not that much because I, I was kind of like, I've already done this. You know, I, I don't need to do it again. Um, right. But I am definitely looking forward to Shadowlands. That's for sure. That's a, yeah. That's going to be my next question because when we were out at BlizzCon, like we went and played Shadowlands, and Chris is really excited about it. I think BFA is saying, like the the reason why he's been enjoying world of warcraft at the moment like he has is like i just haven't been doing bfa stuff like because he he left uh wow like a uh, miss pandaria and a legion like he just like those are things he skipped so he's like oh i'm going back and playing that content because these games are, are massive and then you look yeah. at final fantasy 14 with Shadowbringers. uh you posted uh your last 14 video that i saw was you posted on uh the the heaven's turn you know the new year's event uh, in that case, talking about your playthrough uh, with that. But then as I was going to look, you've been mainly focusing in on kind of deep dives or kind of explaining an intro to a specific game. A lot, like you said in the pre-show, like you could do a video of that for a day and you'll never run out of content because there's yeah, just so exactly. many like, uh, you know, great games out there. And then even be, after you get past the great games, you know, then you have like all just like with movies, there's a lot of content. Uh, what's your what's your hot read right now? as uh, Final Fantasy XIV gears up for 5.2, like with Shadowbringers being critically praised. Uh, I'm curious as your thoughts of the overall state of the game with for Final Fantasy. Um, well, the, the thing is for me, like the two main things I love about Final Fantasy XIV are the story and also crafting mm -hmm. and, you know, the gathering and stuff. I, I love the, that side of it. But my issue was with Shadowbringers is that, yeah, the story is fantastic. The music is unbelievably good. I've never heard music that good in any of my mind. Are you and as upset as me that we that we didn't even get a nod in the in the Game Awards for music? We got three nods, didn't win any. But music um, wasn't even on the cat. Anyway, yeah. The, the thing is, though, with that, because the, the, the people that... The person that won was uh, for Death Stranding. Mm -hmm. And um, I loved the music in Death Stranding. Yeah, that's what Chris said. Yeah, so the... Um, bb's theme had me crying for like a solid hour oh wow so that's the thing so it, it was very powerful music in that game but in terms of if there was a, this own music category for mmos and yeah for, like shadowbringers should have definitely 100 percent. yeah now um like so the the second thing because you were talking about the state of the yeah the, the state game. of the game you said the story yeah. is something and the crafting which we know there's yeah. been lots of changes and there's also more changes on the horizon but anyway yeah go ahead yeah. So um, now, basically, I always liked the challenge of the crafting, and I especially like being able to teach it to other people mm -hmm. because that was my experience in Final Fantasy XI. So in Final Fantasy XI, crafting was really, really hard. Like it would you would you would be affected by which element of which crystal on which mm -hmm. day of the week, by which direction you're facing, <laughs> all this stuff. Yeah. And so, uh, but I, I I learned back in the eleven days that um, you. If you craft yourself, you'll have a lot more fun when you're playing these games rather than being relying on other people, other players being ripped off uh, or whatever. Like being able to make things yourself is really great. Now, the thing with uh, Shadowbringers is that they nerfed it. I think they over nerfed it is my official opinion. Like it, it was okay to rebalance it and so on because people did often complain to me about the jump between A Realm Reborn and Heavensward crafting. They're saying the jump is too big. but. Sorry, um, I feel that um, they 
basically they went a bit too far because like i haven't even made yet my leveling series from 70 to 80 yet mm -hmm. and i've already sort of done some pre um research and i can you can literally level from 70 to 71 with free leaves mm -hmm. yeah that's it so per craft and i i was like really <laughs> so that's why i've not even been motivated to even make this series that's why because it's become a bit too easy but um i i i'll get around to it eventually but because um, I've already finished the story and already up to date, I don't PvP in in 14. I never have. Um, and I, I, I used to PvP in World of Warcraft, but even then I don't really have time anymore for PvP. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't really end game raid either. So you won't see me smashing my head against ultimate raids and whatever, savage raids or anything like that. I don't have that because um, I, I used to be really into raiding back in the World of Warcraft days. And I used to be in more than I actually was in two raiding guilds on two different characters at the same time. Wow. So I've done the raiding aspect of my life already. I've sort of I, I want to say I'm retired from it, if you know what I mean. Like I, I, I don't have that level of satisfaction of the victories anymore because yeah. I, I took down um, Lich King, um, Heroic. I, I took down all of these hard bosses back in the day. And I'm sort of, I moved on from that. But I do like watching some of the other streamers, you know, so I watch Zeno all the time when he's progressing through like new raids. I think it's awesome. Well, and like, it's always great to see ult like when Ultimate releases, like where 14 shows up on Twitch in that regards. Yeah. Cause it's like, oh wow, what's something's happening over here. This is, uh, you know, cause it's, it is like the 1% of the 1% for that kind of content. Like not only have yeah. you cleared Savage, but now here's this. And the fact that they also make it to where it doesn't get easier over time. We see that with yeah. Savage. It's like eventually with gear and with the echo, like you see kind of like it makes it a little bit more accessible with level sync uh, being mm -hmm. removed in, in expansions. And then ultimate's like, nope, <laughs> like, this, oh, yeah. like this is a uh, pristine, this is a, uh, you know, kind of a bragging rights piece of content. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. It's really great to watch Zeno and the other uh, people going for world first uh, in that regards. But go ahead. I, yeah, I interrupted. Yeah. Like so um so basically because of all of that, so because they the the, the nerf to crafting and I've finished the story, I've been focusing on other games. Simple right. as that, because simply this there's an entire industry here. <laughs> so like uh, and there's millions of well, I don't there's not millions, but you know, there's thousands of games you can pick from. And it's almost one of my regrets because I've been a content creator now for like more than six years. Mm -hmm. And for most of that I was focused just on fourteen. Right. So the last sort of like six years, I've missed out on so many other amazing games. So I'm I'm kind of like overly compensating. That's why I'm covering a different game every single day. So um, is to get into the other games I've been missing out. So that brings me to the like the real big question regarding content creation and choosing a game. Like, how do you go about? your process in selecting a game, even if it's just for a day, because not only in the last six years, but if you even look at this year alone, there's tons of stuff. So I want to get your thoughts in a second as well as what's what you're looking forward to. But like, yeah, in six years, you've missed a ton of games. I've missed a ton of games. And if you're going to go back and cover it, what is your is there a criteria or are you just like, you know, rolling the dice and you know seeing where they land? I'm curious. Yeah, well, I mean, I usually go by reputation. That's okay. the main thing. So does it have an amazing trailer? Was I lured in during E3 or the Game Awards or some uh, Tokyo Game Show? Some some big trailer got my attention. Have lots of my friends been recommending the game to uh, me? Okay, you know people like so. For example, um, Nino Kuni. Like I've I'd heard of that game and so, but it got to a point where my viewers were literally like mentioning it to me nearly every single day. So I was really trying my best to like I couldn't ignore it anymore. So I right. played Nino Kuni, and then it ended up being one of my favorite RPGs ever. So like I do pay attention to um, like recommendation from friends, but it's also just like I look at the developer behind the game as well. So like, if, do they have a history of making really fun games? Do I like the way they do things from experience and so on? So it's a, a reputation is probably the main thing that motivates me for selecting which games. Mm -hmm. So um, and I think that's really um, important for me because. Um, and it, also the opposite is true in, in terms of there's a lot of games I outright avoid because of reputation. So, um, and that's the thing. So uh, I don't want to name, I won't name names. So I don't want it to be negative. So, uh, but yeah, so like, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I approach things. So uh, talk to me a little bit about what you're now looking forward to uh, in 2020, because like reputation aside, 
I think 2019 saw there were some really good things that happened, but there's also a lot of hype that didn't ever really pan out. So, like, yeah. in that game selection process, like, are there games that you're looking forward to that are considered as a part of it? Or are you more, like, focusing in on wait till the dust settles and the hype dies down to see if it's something worth your time? Yeah, I mean, because um, there's a, the obvious big four this year. There's Seven Remake, there's mm -hmm. Resident Evil 3, Last of Us 2, and Cyberpunk. And re reputation in all of them. Mm -hmm. So Seven Remake, Square Enix, we all love Square Enix games here. Resident Evil 3, Resident Evil 2 Remake was so fantastic. Like, I loved it so much. And I've got friends who are really, really into Resident Evil series. So they've really been um, getting me into it. And I've, I've been looking now more at the lore as well uh, mm -hmm. so to see about the old Resident Evil. So I'm looking forward to that one. Last of Us, the original Last of Us is one of my, it's in my top five of mm -hmm. favorite games of all time. Like, there isn't a game really that has affected me more than the last of us so when they announced last of us part two i was like yeah got to be on that and cyberpunk purely 100 percent reputation they made the witcher cd project red do amazing work mm -hmm. so i'm looking forward to cyberpunk only for reputation reasons not for anything else i don't know anything about um i've never played a cyberpunk game i think the closest i played to a cyberpunk game was like watchdogs but not really you right. know that that's not that's not really cyberpunk so uh um, pretty much all three all four like out, three out of those four have been delayed uh, yeah. recently and that was kind of ha like once they moved seven i was like man it's backing up right next to cyberpunk but then they moved yeah. cyberpunk which i was like man that actually works for me so the uh yeah. <laughs> so like, for that for that selection though like are, are you going to be following it in the order that it's that it's released like are you playing seven remake on the day especially because yeah, that yeah, was yeah, your yeah. first final fantasy i've pre-ordered all of these games so the second they i get them i'm yeah. playing them nice straight away and um now when it comes to final fantasy itself Seven is not my favorite. Like I know seven is a favorite for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Nine is my favorite. Nine so, is I, incredible. I love Final Fantasy Nine. Nine yeah, is Final incredible. Fantasy Nine was like because like seven was good. I thought I actually thought eight was better than seven, uh, and then but then I thought nine like was really really amazing. Mm -hmm. And I, I I'll be honest, I really didn't like ten. You okay. know I, I think. Final Fantasy X is like really awesome for a lot of people, but for me, it was like it was okay to play. But then when I saw the ending, it was so devastating. I won't spoil it for anyone. I was kind of like, oh, why did I? Why? Why? You know. So, um, and I was kind of like, uh, you know. So, uh, but then I remembered how amazingly happy I was playing Nine. So, um, yeah, uh, it's just the um, I try my best really to think about. Um, the am i going to have fun with this you know and also the the replayability as well does matter to me mm -hmm. now, the problem is with final fantasy games is that once you've seen all the story it's like is it worth for example doing 10 again and completing the sphere grid when you already know the ending of the game you know things like that right so whereas for games like um like i don't know i i'm, I'm hoping with cyberpunk because it's going to be a big brawling city mm -hmm. that um there will be a lot of replayability in terms of there'll be other places to explore but for the games which are really, really story heavy, the second they're finished, I kind of just move on. So I, they I, they yeah. have uh, they've talked with Cyberpunk that there is going to be multiplayer, but it's not coming at the at launch. Like that's going to be down the road. And you know the question is, is that like Final Fantasy fifteen even brought in yeah. a multiplayer component, which I like outside of outside of the loading screens, I really enjoyed. Like I was like, I really like this. And I, if they could solve all of these other issues. This could be like a really cool spinoff or, or something else like that. So how like uh, like in, in terms of that, like the question comes back to the uh, 14, which from the story perspective, if you're only enjoying it from the story, is it important in your mind for anybody who's like actively playing it? If they're here for the story to also weave in other types of games to kind of fulfill that one need rather than just running at this one game for this for a long period of time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, if you play, like I said, very story-heavy games, then the, as soon as the story is, is is done, just find something else to play. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of like you don't have to just wait for months on end for 14 to release more content. There's so many great games. Like even World of Warcraft has got a really good story behind it. So yeah. it's not as it's, it hasn't got anywhere near the quality of narrative like 14 has. But the lore behind it was is really, really good. So, like for example, when I saw um, the trailer of Shadowlands, and you see um, Sylvanas tearing the, um, the yeah, crown, of yeah, the, the Lich, Lich King. King's crown in half, I thought she was going to put it on, 
And then she's yeah. like, and it's like, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. but, but when you look at the Warcraft lore, like, you really, really understand why that was such a significant moment for her. Because it was the Lich King that turned her into a Banshee to begin with. So for her, it was like the ultimate revenge going back to like previous Warcraft games. And I love looking at that side of Warcraft, like delving deeper into it. And um, what, so, like I said, when, when coming back to the story aspect, like just find another game. There's so many story driven games and you just go through all of them. I would recommend uh, games like Last of Us, obviously Resident Evil, uh, but even Nino Kuni that has great storyline behind it. There is a, a plethora of really good story games. I, I was saying as well that these days gaming is kind of like interactive movies. Mm -hmm. So um, like you, you're actually able because some people used to like old friends used to criticize me about, oh, you play games or blah, blah, blah. And I was just <laughs> like, yeah, it's better than just sitting down and watching TV shows or movies because at least I can interact with it. I can actually add some value to this. You know, rather than just sitting and watching a movie, and then just as soon as credits roll, then you're like, okay, whatever. You know, next, it's like um, you, you actually feel like you earned the ending, yeah, by by playing the game. So, um, and it, it's it's important, I feel, really, to walk away, uh, like because even when it comes to MMOs, like if you play a game nonstop for years and years and years and years, eventually you're gonna get you're gonna get sick of it, as, as with anything in life. You know, you you need like you always need some sort of variety. So, and that's the, the aspect I've been picking up on a lot these days is the variety aspect is to see what other creative worlds are out there and so on. Have you, and, um, oh, good, sorry. No, no, okay. No, I was going to jump in. It's like, have you played any of the uh, Tales series? Because Chad's talking about Tales of Zealia and Zestra. I loved yeah. the Tales series back on the PlayStation, but I've fallen yeah. off of that, that train for a while. So have you played any of the recent Tales games? Yeah, I played um, Zestria and Biseria. So, and I thought they were fantastic. I, I really, really liked them. The combat in Zysteria was, uh, it, I was able to get through it, but Basiri I thought was really fun. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to, to Tales of Arise, which is going to be the next one. Yeah. So like, I'm very, very, very much looking forward to it, especially because there's going to be that generational leap um, in terms of graphics and so on. Like we've already seen the previews, so Bandai are really, really pushing it with the next one. Nice. So, um, and that, that's why I feel as well. Like a lot of these games have been delayed, but I think it will be, it'll be worth it. Like they delayed God of War, mm -hmm. and it ended up getting like four, forty perfect scores and blah blah blah. So, you know, the delays for polish is is a good thing. It's not a yeah. bad thing, especially when they have their their vision right. I mean, it's like because uh, sometimes you see like with fifteen, ultimately that was built off of the rubbles of like previous delayed so it's like yeah like i'm always for delay until you're ready and i wish i honestly wish 15 was delayed another year because when you go mm -hmm. back and you like when you experience the whole of it i felt like all of it watching the movie playing the dlc doing the animes you know it's like oh wow like this is this really interesting world now they're coming out with a mobile mmorpg which if it's mobile only i know you cover a lot of mobile games I, I yep. always like, I want to play it on either my PC or my Switch. So bring yep. it to those platforms and we're golden. But the, uh, like, I think that at the core of it, like, I just go, wow, like they, they definitely have something, but it was, I felt like they had to push it out. I think they were like, people have been expecting this for 10 years, yep. just release it. So, um, the, I uh, got a question regarding, uh, streaming because yep. I, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is my ignorance as a <laughs> poor interviewer, the, I'm I'm under the assumption you've been doing YouTube for six years and you didn't do streaming right away. Is no. that correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay, yeah. So what got you then into streaming? Streaming in and of itself has really blown up over the last mm. couple of years. Through la I would say last three or four specifically as more public has become, um, you know, aware of it. But obviously you like do a lot of streaming. And so yeah. what is your relationship with that uh, as, a, as a just as a content creator? in a streaming platform versus that a YouTube. And if anybody's watching this podcast going, well, how do, like, if you were advising, if you're trying to teach somebody how to get into that, like what advice would you have as somebody who does both? Yeah, um, well, I would say what's important is to prioritize. Like today, you're gonna to stream. Today, you're gonna to do YouTube videos. If you try and do both on the same day, it's, it's too much. I'm do, I do this full time and that's too much if I try and do both of the same day. So, um, and uh, when it comes to my, when I started streaming, I actually, I was, 
I started being a YouTuber in 2013, but maybe a year after, like a whole year of YouTubing, then I decided to be a streamer. Okay. Um, and the reason why I, I got, got into it originally was just simply because everyone else was. Uh, I'll be perfectly honest. I thought like, well, yeah, a lot, a lot of people on YouTube are also streaming on Twitch, so let's check it out. But as time went on, my, my I fell in love with it, with just having that live interaction with the audience because it was nice interacting with people in the comments, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you know, answering people and so on. But um, having them to be able to to talk to is really great, especially now because with um, streaming, when you put it on like low latency. You can reply to people in literally like what like a second mm -hmm. you know so it's almost like you're talking to them live so um and, and i did i do i do like that but um the when it comes to twitch itself um because um, i'm obviously going to be very careful here because i'm obviously a twitch partner so i'm a, you know but like um like i i did find back in the day the twitch partnership process very frustrating but thankfully they fixed all of that now like they uh you know there is a path to being a partner and easy to get into the affiliate so you can get a sub button and so on so uh, they mm -hmm. made it easy in that sense now the thing was for me is that i actually did get really frustrated with the old twitch partnership application before that came in mm -hmm. and um i applied to be partner several times and i got rejected every time and there wasn't even a, a reason they were just right. all like just just no you know try again later and so I actually gave up on Twitch for a while and I went over and I streamed on YouTube gaming before I even knew it was YouTube gaming. Yeah. Because I, I knew that they, they made an announcement that they're revamping their streaming service, but um, they, I didn't know it was going to be focused on gaming. I just thought it was streaming generally. And so I went over there and um, I, I made a random video on YouTube. I basically just said like, um, YouTube, if you're watching, I volunteer as tribute to test your, st your streaming software. But then a Googler actually saw it, mm -hmm. actually saw the video. By coincidence, he just happened to be a 14 fan. So, and then he invited me to YouTube Gaming. Now, the the reason I was on YouTube Gaming for about a year, the reason I came back is because of lack of innovation. You know, so it, it felt at that point after that year, it felt like Twitch was releasing a new feature every single week mm -hmm. uh, to support the streaming, you know, bits and Prime, Twitch Prime. I think Twitch Prime is like the best thing ever, really, to be honest. I think everyone should Twitch Prime to work the game, just saying. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it did feel really like they were every single week were adding new features, whereas YouTube in, in that year released about two. So Not just I ended that up... year, man. Like it's, yeah. I, like I'm not, I don't consider myself a streamer, but we do like our community game nights on Monday nights, like on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And that's just, we're streaming on, on that. And it's, I go and I'm, I'm looking at Envy on Mixer and on you on Twitch, and it's not a monetary Envy. Like you have the like now on Twitch, you got the little channel uh, currency, right? Like just watching, you can do things. Mixer yeah. has the same thing. You level up on the channel, and then there's things that you can do that aren't monetarily based. And right now over on YouTube, it's like you can either spend money um, or not. And it's like it would be so cool especially for people who like, who don't have that, like who just want to make the stream more engaging. And like, if you've like just the, the, like the, I called them <laughs> power balls for our channel currency, but just the fact that you can highlight your message or you can, you can do different things. So you're not sitting here and feeling like, you know, like, Oh man, if I really want to like, and we're, I would say relatively small, but imagine somebody like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Disrespect or, or all these like bigger streamers who have different like uh, ways about them. Like now you can be a part of that by doing what you're doing. And that's wa like watching and engaging, but yeah. go ahead. Like, that's just like where I'm like, Oh dear YouTube yeah. gaming, like, please like, just, like anybody on your staff go and spend yeah. time on any of these platforms and then just come back and be like, here's our roadmap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think um, I think part of the delay with YouTube is that they were dealing with all the flipping copyright oh, yeah. stuff and all the drama and then the FTC and all this other stuff. So YouTube has <laughs> much bigger problems to worry about compared to Twitch. But like the, the biggest Twitch so streamers true. who actually inspire me are the variety streamers mm -hmm. not the so you have the massive like you know before we used to have Ninja then you have uh, still on the platform you still have people like Tim the Tapman mm -hmm. and Dr. Lupo and so on, but they play shooter games, you know, and I'm sort of like, I really don't like Fortnite at all, but I can watch Tim playing it just because he makes it so fun. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, the people I tend to watch the most are people like, for example, Co Carnage. Co Carnage can play any game 
and the chat will be thriving the everything will be going really well and like even when before god of war came out god of war 4 he went through the original god of war series yeah and even when he was playing god of war 1 he still had like 10,000 viewers so i i love that aspect like having the chat there because the experience part a lot of the experience on twitch is is the chat is seeing the comments of the chat that's why i love watching the um like when they do big announcements or they do big conferences and so on is watching the sort of sarcastic comments people put in the chat and um it just makes it it adds to the experience it really does so um yeah and but it's like um when, when it comes to youtube youtube are working hard to improve their platform all the time but mm -hmm. the sheer size of youtube it's like it's difficult to do that that's the that's the the thing compared to twitch because because uh, youtube has got such a broad like it can encapsulate anything whereas and video as well as streaming yeah whereas twitch is like i know twitch does video but it's like it's more focused on the streaming on the live and it, aspect it, it, it so, allows them to be narrow like from a development perspective like they can be narrow and more focused in on that one aspect where youtube has got like it is the it is a platform for all and we've seen that and that's where like i would love to see more of that investment in live content over there and i think they're going to be doing that they just signed like the esl they just signed uh you know uh, the overwatch league and the and the call of duty league like they're they're getting e like they're they made like a big sign for these esports which is like that's great I mean, that's actually like really I think really good for the platform because at the, the numbers wise like it's twitch is the number one in hours and then followed by YouTube gaming uh, you know is the number two and they're both neck and neck in terms of like the revenue that they both uh, bring in um, by yeah. one percentage twitch at 23 and YouTube at 22 percent of the revenue generated from live content around games and then you take that into account with uh, just the sheer volume of what you, Twitch is tar targeting this year. They, Twitch wants to make a billion dollars in revenue in 2020. And that means that that's a big industry. That's yeah. massive. That's a massive, and that's an unfathomable amount of money in my mind. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I just wondered to see, like with, the, with you two making those plays, like if they're going to be following it up with behind the scenes. For me personally... Like the one change I would I would make if I can only get one today, would be separate notifications for live and for uh, uploads because like yeah. have a like a live vod you know um, section and have that completely separate from uploads because we tend to find I don't know if it's you saw this back in the day be curious as to your experience before you switch back to Twitch especially after like uh, apparently a Googler saw your video the is like some people really enjoy live content and some people don't and it can end up having um either them you know unsub from the channel or whatever if you're one thing or the, or too much of the other so it'd be mm -hmm. like right now we have the bell for all or sometimes and we're none and then it's like man it would be cool if it was like uh notify me if i'm live not you know non-live content both or you know so that it's like okay you're not sitting here like okay, you don't care about live, that's cool, we get it. We're not going to sit here and try to recommend these VODs to you. And so, yeah. yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Like, so the Googler saw you, and obviously the uh, the primitive YouTube gaming at the at the time. Uh, how long did you do that before you decided to make that full push for partner on Twitch? Um, I, I did it for a solid year. Oh, wow. And, uh, I'll be... I'll be perfectly honest. I didn't miss Twitch in that time <laughs> so because I was so angry with the old partnership program. I was kind of like, I'm done with Twitch. I'm 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 finished. But but then I I came back when I said when when I saw the momentum going, and I literally I remember by coincidence I tweeted at Twitch support um, maybe a week after I came back to Twitch, and I said from a business point of view, why doesn't every single like streamer on the platform have a sub button? Twitch will make more money. Yeah. Like no one loses the stream will make money twitch will make money it doesn't make any sense that everyone doesn't have the sub button and then they announced that the twitch affiliate system literally like the next day so it wasn't because of me you know right. but, but your 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 fingers on the pulse of yeah. both the the content creator and the you know the viewer the, the part of the community so yeah, yeah. absolutely because i was like when they announced that i was like oh like that's fascinating and then just the last announcement they said that even affiliates get ad revenue yeah. And it's probably at a reduced rate, just like everything else. But it's still like, okay, cool. I was like, that's that's nice, I guess. You know, yeah. if you're putting content out there. But go go ahead. Yeah. Now the thing is, though, um, is uh, 
when it comes to the different platforms, I would just do the clear separation. YouTube for videos, Twitch for streaming. That, that's that's it. That's how I've separated the, the two. For now, uh, we'll see if YouTube um, like does any sort of innovations to mm -hmm. uh, tempt people. Because What would tempt you back? Sort of, um, I'm not sure. Uh, like, uh, just maybe just they would have to really escalate the monetization because I, I get like maybe 20, 30 times more views on YouTube than I do on Twitch. And yet on Twitch, I make three, four times more money. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the thing. So the, the the revenue versus the sort of effort versus the um, the output is is not it's not. I don't want to say it's not fair, but it's not realistic on YouTube. I think YouTube doesn't pay enough. You're right. So um, they they need to add more innovations. And I think the paying millions of dollars for a few big streamers or contracts is not going to be enough to no. make the platform. They have to innovate actual features. So, but I am very happy with what Twitch are doing. You know, the, the path to partner is great. The like the hype trains, like they added recently, I thought I think that's really good. Mm -hmm. And um, the channel points, like, I I have my own like uh, tracking bot which I was using for points anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy that that's now built into Twitch. Yeah. So that's uh, that's really great because that that like rewards loyalty basically, and, and that's what you want from the uh, from the viewers. And just to make it fun for for people, and also what YouTube needs to do really is that they just need to really fix the recommendations, like and who they promote. Because my personal feeling is that once the YouTube algorithm turns on you, that's it. Like you're screwed, maybe even for years. <laughs> you know, whereas um, like I don't think it's like that on Twitch. But then again, I don't think there's any algorithm on Twitch. So, um, and I think that's something that people do complain about is that there isn't enough promotion on Twitch like for, to people to get discovered so um it, it's kind of like you need the marriage between multiple platforms you need one feeding the other uh, and vice versa you can't like if you just start on twitch alone and you have nothing you have no social media no youtube no nothing at all it's going to be very very hard to get out of the zero viewer um sort of like hole because mm. your your stream will be right right down the bottom people might never see you unless you recommend to friends or family or whoever right so uh whereas in my case all the time people come into my live stream and say watch your videos love them wanted to say hi things like that so because i've got that constant funnel coming in that's very very uh that's very useful so but i think it will take youtube years to um even be moderately okay for streaming i don't think i don't at this point i don't know if they'll ever catch up to twitch in terms of innovation because anything that they do from now on will just feel like they're copying from Twitch. That's the that's the. Well, and the the, like now. again, like I would, I, like I I could care less if they copy from Twitch in that regards. Like I would even be fine if they rename their subscribe button to follow and their membership join button to subscribe, just so that right. like everybody's speaking the same kind of language. Like follow us on YouTube, or if you if if you want subscribe right now, it's like join the membership program, and it's like. It just doesn't have the same kind of communal aspects or the culture uh, to which yeah. has a uh, like a such it's built this culture around chat mixers trying to buy that culture. I, I have no fault in mixer trying to buy the culture or YouTube trying to buy that kind of culture, that kind of that clout, that, those kind of creators, because they're late to the game. You know, it's like, well, you got to if you were first and you, you're number one, like you're good. I, I'm excited to see that though between Mixer and YouTube because I think it benefits the content creator. If YouTube mm -hmm. steps up and makes it a makes it a thing, it gives you more negotiating power in terms of like where is your community best served? Is it on Mixer? Is it on YouTube? Is it on Twitch? Uh, you know, for this particular kind of content, and then that makes hopefully Twitch say, well, you want to be here because not only. It, like, yeah, it took YouTube six years to create this feature we had for this thing, but now we've got this next thing for you, you know, et cetera. They, competition, I think, is a is a healthy thing ultimately for uh, creators in that regards. The, um, yeah, that, I love that. I loved your insight there. It's just yeah. so interesting, especially because you do this full time. You are a partner, uh, you know, and, and that. What would Twitch do? What could Twitch do uh, besides promotion? I think that's the number one thing. I think you get any uh, any streamers on Twitch, they're like, yeah, like discoverability, like what what what's there? Like, do you think Twitch would benefit from what YouTube does in terms of video uploads to where like it would be more recommending, you know, like to, to start to balance it out and compete for that space that, that YouTube kind of dominates? 
Um, potentially, potentially, because um, like when it comes to like you know, so some people who do reruns, for example, like and some of their reruns are really like Co Carnage. Like I mentioned him before. He, I think, just yesterday he was doing a rerun for Sekiro, and he had maybe two, three thousand people watching, and people were chatting to each other, and people were even subbing. You know, I think that side is an, a, a part of Twitch that they really, really should work at. Like, really, the, the VOD content can really have huge potential mm -hmm. because people like watching VODs. Like, I, I watch VODs all the time, personally. So um, I think that's a sort of something that they're not capitalizing on that they could. Um, when it comes to... Um, I don't think they'll ever be able to compete directly with YouTube in VOD content, but they could develop that side of things. Like, maybe they could add incentives that if you watch the VOD, um, if you didn't catch it live, then you'll get bonus points. Or I don't know what, what innovations they could do. But the, the other thing that I really like that Twitch is doing at the moment is the more interactivity with the fact that Amazon is the owner. You know, so they're bringing, they're allowing some people to stream prime videos um, on uh, TV shows and potentially movies over on Twitch. Yeah. I think that, that side needs more work. Yeah. I would love, because I think lots of streamers already have movie nights with or community nights or whatever if i could do that here on twitch and not some like sleazy shared link on discord or whatever then that would be wonderful you know that's why i'm really looking forward to the, the idea of watch parties i think that would be awesome mm -hmm. so and even if it's like the strict rules on it i can understand copyright and movies and all the other stuff fine but just having that ability on the platform would be amazing and that's something that youtube probably wouldn't be able to do for years if, if ever so um that's the thing so it's the um yeah so I, I would like them to to be able to develop their vod content side of things and i'm sure they're working on it and also not to delete vods after like what 45 days or 60 days you know yeah. i wish like, youtube keep them forever so like if um if you just select that yeah i want this playthrough of this game to be kept forever please keep it that's why i actually go out of my way to highlight all of my full playthroughs of games because I don't want them to be just lost like, yeah. and they're not able to relive the experience because that's that's what I've always said is that um, my entire presence as a content creator has always been to have a video log of every all the gaming I've done over the years. So 20 years time, I could look back and be like, oh, I can look back at when I played Final Fantasy 15 for the first time. It's great. Let's look at this video. Let's see my reaction. Let's see the tears running down my face when yeah. I saw the ending. So, and things like that. Well, that's so, what people, a lot of people have been enjoying uh, Shadowbringers reactions to the ending. Watching, like, after the fact, like, Shadowbringers, such a story-driven game, tends to be protected, uh, protected, so a lot of people didn't really watch at the time. Now, after the fact, that VOD, that here's the re the raw reaction, people are like, did they, like, what was their reaction? This was my reaction. Like, am I crazy for feeling sad and happy and conflicted over Emmett Selk and da-da-da-da? You know, it's like, and then you can go and actually experience that, that re that real that 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 and that's one of the th I guess always has been a draw in live because it's like like it's real time it's you know this is uh, this happening uh, I was uh, playing Dragon Quest Eleven and I wasn't live and my wife came in and she's like are you are you live and I go no she's like I wish you were because I was yeah. having such an emotional reaction to that story um, for many reasons and I talked about it on the channel. Um, yeah. but she's like, I wish it was live because it's so real. It, it, this is like, you know, and she knows me and she knows like, that's my, like, there, it's not me playing it up. It's literally just me. And I think that's one of the appeals of live. Cause it's like, you can have that real time or semi, you know, as close to real time, depending on the latency, uh, you know, yeah. interactions with, uh, with that. And so a uh, nightmare and Chad was talking about how, uh, he would like to see like kind of a curated list of like clips and things like that recommendations. Uh, and things like that you would see over on Twitch, like as you kind of see it on YouTube right now. And so chat's been kind of talking about that. I think that's really fascinating. Uh, would you? Would that be something that's interesting? Because even though the VODs do expire, you do go and highlight, like as a part of like just some kind of side content, like where somebody could come in, maybe they're not interested in live, but they could just go and let it just hit a playlist of clip to clip to clip to clip. But do you think that would help discoverability over on Twitch? Yeah, potentially. So like, you know how, like, do you ever use Pinterest? Uh, no, my wife does that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so on um, on Pinterest, you can make like a, almost like a gallery. Like these are the things that you're covering and links directly to your content. So like for example, I've been making a I've been updating my Pinterest for the What Is games, you know the What Is series, 
And so each one, I've got a nice image that basically links to the What Is video. So I would love to have a library like that. That these are all the games I've finished on Twitch. Mm -hmm. And if you click on the on the, the the visual tab, that it will take you to the full playthrough VOD of it. So rather than me having to say set that up on Pinterest, like having it on Twitch itself, like I think that would be really really cool. Because um, if if people like look through my um, my VODs, they would see, for example, I've got like a playlist of full playthroughs but it's just an endless library whereas if you saw actual stamped video cover art of each game that i've covered mm -hmm. that would look a lot more appealing it's like oh he actually played breath of the wild let's click yeah. this link let's see what you know what his experience was like so um you know things like that i think it would be really it would be really good if twitch can make it more visual for people like because i i tend to be more of a visual person so i i do need bright color colorful like boxes uh, that you know i can easily click on yeah, so, oh, and that's one of the things that's great about from uh, from just the games perspective. If you go to Twitch, you're browsing the games, it's got the box art cover, so it's all very visually drawing you in. And then it's like I've kind of, I think YouTube's got a lot of work to do to catch up uh, in yeah. in that regards because you could easily go into, like you said, just like your channel page and be like, here's the, here's his catalog, you know, here's the here's all these games that he's got different content on. You could select it by the game type cover that would be i think that'd be visually very appealing i gotta i gotta uh it's not on the outline but uh just diving into our con content of twitch here and that kind of concept as well as our shared uh love for mmorpgs uh later this year <laughs> i don't know if you followed this at all there's a lot of drama already around it it's i'm just like all right drama like whatever um the uh the mmo new world developed by amazon game studios they've already confirmed there's going to be a massive Twitch integration with this game. Uh, there's going right. to be benefits for streaming this game. You're going to know if someone is streaming this game in game and more. Uh, they've obviously, you know, there's some news. So I don't want to sit here and just dive into the, the, the conversation around it unless A, you're interested in it or B, you, you know about it because you might not. But back to kind of our how do you pick a game? And more, but this I think relates. Have you followed New World at all? Are you aware of that MMO? Are you interested in that at all? And if no, we'll move on to my next question. <laughs> yeah, I, I know a little bit about it. So I, I saw the trailer. I know that it's the first game being developed by Amazon Game Studios. I saw the interviews of like how the developers are approaching it and so on. Now, um, talking about Amazon specifically, the people who run Amazon are very, very, very business minded. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean not like EA, you right. know, they're not here to just make money and like, you know, like it doesn't matter what the user thinks. They want the maximum satisfaction for the users so that they make more money. That's why Amazon now is, if it's not already, is about to be a trillion dollar company. Oh, it is, so, a, trillion, yeah, it is a trillion dollar company that pays yeah. like zero in federal taxes. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a that's a different topic. But yeah. the um, they are very, very good at business. So if they do that, I, I think that would be very clever because they're basically just maximizing on what they have. So they have Twitch. They, they are fully showing that they are the owners of Twitch and they are actually using Twitch. They're not yeah. just the owners. They're not just the, the hidden landlord. Like they are actually right. maximizing this platform as much as they can. Yeah. That's why I said Twitch Prime. Whoever thought of Twitch Prime at Amazon, well, if, even if it's someone on Twitch, genius. Absolute well, genius. It's such a game separator when you compare that to Mixer and to YouTube to the point where you just, you're just, I'm just waiting to see what happens next because it yeah. does, like, oh, you mean you can support your favorite content creator basically for free? Yeah. Wow. And that ends up making the content creator saying like, oh, this is something I can do so I can create more content. Uh, you know, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like you got to pay your bills, you know, you got to eat, you know, it's like yeah. you're looking like you lost some weight. I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> you got to sit here and do these like natural human things. So that in and of itself is, is a massive thing. Uh, and I do want to, I, I want to get back to your thought, but I do see no uh, zero RPGs talking about not a huge fan of PVP in new world. Um, they have made some massive PVP announcement changes and that's kind of what the draw. I'd like to kind of dive into that in a minute, Z Zio, but back to, uh, back to your thought though, on that though, for the fact that with Twitch prime and then I jumped in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was saying about as well, when it comes to New World specifically, like any MMO when it launches, it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be full of flaws. Yeah. What is really important, what makes a successful MMO is how they support the game afterwards. Mm -hmm. So will Amazon listen to feedback? Will they actually change everything? 
or will they focus on a narrative okay this is what we want it to be so we're going to ignore everyone and just focus on this is what we want to achieve because if they do that that's a recipe for a disaster yeah that's what made 1.0 in 14 like flop as, well, as horrible as it did mm-hmm. um so um like but now that with uh 2.0 well since 2.0 and yoshi p does listen to everyone that, that's why that's a lot of the reason why there's been the success in 14 is because of they're actually listening so i hope amazon do that i hope they really really take things on board um so uh, and that's that's all i hope and when it comes to the integration like the integration um into streaming and playing games that's happening naturally anyway mm-hmm. so they might as well capitalize on it because they own an entire streaming pla- they own the most popular streaming platform so they might as well like uh, you know give advantage and capitalize on that as much as they can yeah because they can p- potentially innovate ideas which other hopefully other games developers will be inspired as like yeah maybe we can just do the same thing well so, and, and we've seen some of that over the last uh, over 2019 with different extensions and things like that that relate to a game and how the not just as a part of like we talk about the interaction of the stream not just about using channel points to increase like to highlight a message but using uh, X, Y, and Z to to literally go and say I'm going to mess with the, the game or I'm going to do these different things in this game. That is such a next level thing. And Mixer's doing something uh, similar in that regards, which is like that is just next level stuff in which that it, it adds to both the entertainment value of of the the game and the uh, and the stream and more. I just find it just utterly fascinating in that regards. Um, so, like, as far as it goes, I do want to talk about, like, uh, you, you mentioned you're not really a PvPer, right? And so that's one of the things when I first was looking at a new world. It's like, oh, it, they were talking about this open world concept for PvP. And they have since kind of changed that. They've now, you, it's a toggleable thing. Uh, a lot of people who are looking forward to that kind of the ganking mentality, um, you know, or like you could get killed anytime and be a criminal and like all that, uh, are, are frustrated. And my, my, my personal view on it is we're just going to have to wait to see how we go hands on with it. Um, hmm. and then at the same time for people who are upset by it, like those seem to be people who are like, well, in the alpha, y'all just murdered each other, apparently ruthlessly, whether that's true or not, I can't say one or the, the other. So y'all provided the feedback that that had the change <laughs> it's like yeah. inadvertently through the data. So it's like, well, maybe we can only just be mad at yourself. Um, if that's something you wanted. And so, um, the, with those PVP changes and, and the PVE focus and the integration, uh, is, um, what would have you like play and stream that game um, because that's also the beta is coming out and this kind of relates to early access of games and how important that is to you like is that something that um because you said like the mmo is really going to be defined by how it's supported and more yeah. being that we don't know those answers and we won't know those answers they can only be answered with time is something like new world and something like uh getting in early important for you uh, or is that something you'd rather just wait and see um, I, I, it's probably not that important at the moment because um, MMOs are a big decision. Like, uh, simply, like if I, for example, start playing World of Warcraft again, I won't be playing 14 for while I'm playing World of Warcraft. Right. So, New World won't tempt me in. Um, I'll, I will see how the beta goes. Um, uh, if the beta goes really well and there's a lot of raving feedback about it, then sure, then I'll check out the actual, if there's like an early release or whatever. But I will not. Um, I, I don't think I'll I'll take part in the be I'll, I'll just but I will pay attention to it for yeah. sure and I will I'll, I'll see what they've done. because at the end of the day, um, fine they have infinite money behind their studio but like do they have the experience that's the question do they you know have have they don't have any games under their belt because it's they have actually a lot of games like they're they're formerly Double Helix so Amazon bought experience now oh, okay. yeah so it's like uh, I've actually been a fan of the studio for a long time they they did Killer Instinct. And so it's oh, like, okay. yeah. And so from my perspective, I'm like, okay, like your, your kind of thing is like, I've, I've decided to pre-order and, and that's something I, I always weigh heavily. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and like, do I trust the studio? I did. I don't know if I, I know the new one. Um, mm-hmm. but I think it's like, oh, it could be interesting because for me, like I've, I've long, when I look at my critique for 14, I go, it's great as a as a narrative experience it's great in these regards it's got i think a really great raid it's got like that i wish it had more sandbox i wish that after you have done that like within a let like it's like you kind of can the the developers are like here are the tools go nuts and experiment and and etc and so my my thing with new world is like is it going to be like do i really like the sandbox or did i just love 11 did i really enjoy that kind of style of play where you're kind of not necessarily guided through the game 
are you like able to experience and explore and discover by trial and error? You know, is that, is that going to be a good relationship for me? And then on, also on the same horizon, uh, Fantasy Star Online 2, finally coming to North America. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it's like when you talk about like playing multiple games, like, dear Lord, like there's yeah. just, it feels like there, this this year alone could be not just the resurgence of, uh, or not just like the domination of these streaming platforms, but a resurgence of kind of the MMORPG. And at Fantasy Star yeah. Online 2, you get the class and subclass system. And I, I said, I, I, it wouldn't work in 14 because it wasn't designed for it. But man, how epic would it be if the sub job system was like, if we just pulled one thing from 11, like, yes, yeah. there's going to be a meta. Can't help you. But outside of the meta for the raid, like just go nuts, like build something silly and, and you know, like have fun and go play and try to see if you can't do whatever. Like that's how metas change is through mm -hmm. experimentation and more like that. Uh, have you uh, have you followed Fantasy Star Online two at all? Because it's been uh, primarily in Japan. I I've, I saw the announcement only, but there's um the the thing is like I think a lot of people were upset the fact that it's going to be on Xbox. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Oh, so... In in in, uh, in comments, it's like oh, and I'm like I feel you. Like you know yeah. I feel you. <laughs> now the sort of opposite happened for me in terms of like I had a power surge in my house. My PlayStation shorted. I couldn't switch on for like two months. Oh, it no. just wouldn't, it wouldn't activate. Eventually, it started working again. I don't know why. God, who, who knows physics and electrical engineering? But two months later, it started working. In the meantime, I was only using my Xbox, mm -hmm. and um, I, I have an Xbox One X. And since then, I am mostly using my Xbox rather than my PlayStation. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the thing. So I don't mind it being on on the Xbox. Now, in terms of Fantasy Star itself, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. But I'm more looking forward to the new MMOs, the new anime type MMOs, like um, Blue uh, Burst or um, oh, I have it. Oh, sorry, what's it called? It's Blue, um, uh, Blue Protocol. Blue Protocol, yeah, yeah, the um, Bandai Namco one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, the anime one. Oh, it looks yeah. solid, dude. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So th those sort of MMOs, those are, I'm really, really looking forward to. Um, so yeah, now in terms, of, and again with Fantasy Star, like I will probably look at it while it's in beta. I will I will look at it, but like I said, MMOs are such a huge decision because they occupy so much time. Like I, I've got fourteen hundred videos on YouTube just about Final Fantasy fourteen, and that's one MMO. Yeah. So it, and even doing this full time, I don't have time to play, for example, fourteen and WoW. Right. I just I just don't have the time. So um, I don't see. But like I said, if if I if I really feel that I'll get not only a lot of fun and uh, fun out of it but my friends will as well like my friends will come with me mm -hmm. um to the game and everyone wants to play it then yeah sure I'll, I'll check it out but what i really really want in an mmo is the sort of going around this is my my visualization for the future going around with a group party whatever seeing something in game and being like oh my god look at that yeah amazing and i feel that that's going to happen probably in the next generation Mm -hmm. But um, like uh, that—that's the moment I'm waiting for. That's something that will tempt me away from a game like 14. But Yoshi P is already pre-seeing that, so he's already been talking about like, is he going to update the engine of 14 and stuff like that? But it's just not a priority right now compared to all the other stuff they're working. Do you think he's going to do that, or is it, are they just going to make a new game? Um, I think it depends. Like if if 6.0 whatever as after shadowbringers is, is a, a massive massive success then maybe but if it's not then uh, they, yeah they, they probably will just focus on the next um, mmo if it's going to be like final fantasy 17 or something like that so but we haven't even had final fantasy 16 announced yet so yeah i know i hope they don't tell us about 16 if it's especially if it's a single player narrative game uh until it's like six months out like don't like don't even tell me until i can I'm close to playing it because we've just had these like uh, Kingdom Hearts three. Like that was a 10 year project. Like there's all these like, OK, you know, development's hard. Things change. Things change. You know, like don't tease it. Just say, guys, we're like we're literally six months from release. It's it's gone gold. Now we're just yeah. promoting the crap out of it, getting people excited and go. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. So it's like that way my heart like, yeah, I know they're working on 16. I don't need to hear a peep about it. Don't don't make don't tease it for years and years and years. Like seven seven remake is a, is already at five years, you yeah. know. And it's like when they they showed that off, I go, oh man, that, I can't wait to play that. And I think I said, 
I think I said I can't wait to play that in 2020. I like I was in a content creator at the time. I, I literally remember going like, oh, that looks great. I'm betting 2020. And somebody's yeah. like, no, it's going to be in, you know, you know, two years. I go, okay. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like, sure thing. You know, if it is, awesome. I, I, would, I want to be wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just um, they go for uh, sort of quality, isn't it? Now, the, the thing is, like, I remember back, at, like, I was really young when Final Fantasy X came out. Mm -hmm. When I first saw the first announcement of it on, was it PlayStation 2? Yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is so amazing. Like when you compare the graphics of 10 to oh, like yeah. 9, yeah. it was such a massive, And the massive voice theme. acting, you know, because that was the yeah. first one that was voice acted. You're like, wow, like this is, oh man, this, I've always wanted to hear their voices. Yeah. But then the, the issue was, is that it, I waited so long for it to come out that by the time it actually did launch, I almost didn't care anymore because I was waiting for it every single day. It's like, is Final Fantasy X here yet? Is it here yet? Is it here yet? Because I, I'm, I'm quite, like I said, I'm OC. I'm actually diagnosed OCD, so I'm not just act OCD. I am OCD. Mm -hmm. So the um, like that was torture for me. So w when it comes to like Seven Remake, I, I am actually not. Um, I'm not waiting for it. If it gets delayed a year, like I'm not waiting for it. Like I'm just living my life. Otherwise, I will drive myself crazy every day. It's like, oh, I want. I want to see, I want to play, I want to whatever. But to be honest, like um, I, I'm doing very well to resist that feeling with Last of Us 2. Mm. Like I, out of the four games, Last of Us 2 is my number one. It's the one I'm the most looking forward to. So um, yeah, but like I say, it's just the, um, like I, I, I don't, I, I think it's a good thing if they delay. Yeah. Because it was really, really shown with E3, was it 2018? When Sony, I think that was the first time Sony just didn't go to the event. Or, oh no, sorry. They went to the to 2018, didn't they? But yeah. they only showed off like five, Four games. six games. Four games. They, yeah. uh, maybe a few more on the floor, but it's like they had like here's our big four, and yeah. I think two of those are out: Spider Man and um, like another one. And now we're still waiting on Last of Us and Ghost of uh, Tsushima. Tsushima. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, because what they really showed, because Xbox came along and they had 50 games that they did world exclusives for and all the rest of it. And then PlayStation comes along and it's like, oh, here's our five. But the thing is, so those five, like you said, the quality is so high, they, they obviously went to for quality, not quantity. That's what they were going for. Yeah. So um, it, it's not it's not a bad thing if they just release a few unbelievable games rather than loads of mediocre ones. So, but the thing is, so like, Xbox, what, what Microsoft is showing with both Xbox and Mixer is that they really, really care about gaming. Mm -hmm. You know, they are, they are trying very, very hard. Like, they, they want Xbox to be the most powerful console. They want Mixer, they want it to grow, but they know that they have a hard time with against Twitch. That's why they're spending the tens of millions to get people like Ninja and Shroud and so on over to their platform. Right. You want to bring so. have them bring in and then ideally say, hey, like, it, well, now that you're in the ecosystem, go check out this person or this person and, and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Because I, I actually, I'll, I'll be honest, like, I did actually go over to Mixer a few times just, just to watch Shroud. Yeah. So it, it worked. You know, that them, them paying the money for Shroud was a way to get me onto Mixer. So, um, but... The um, the the thing is with with Microsoft really is that they they they're trying very 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 hard, but I don't know if they're really innovating anything there by themselves. So like for example, they're buying lots of studios, mm -hmm. but is there an actual Microsoft studio for Xbox where it's a hundred percent Microsoft? They started it, they make games. I don't know if there is. They're, they they I have think a handful. Studio... Like when you look at Age of Empires and things like that, like. Those are those are internal that grew uh, for that, but it's like, yeah, what's their thing? No, they bought Bungie. They bought, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the thing. Whereas PlayStation, they really because one thing that I would recommend everyone do if they haven't already, um, PlayStation released really really good documentaries of the making of games, and one documentary they made was for God of War. Like yeah. we talked about it before. And that documentary was really good. And um, but what was really in like I learned a lot from it was the influence of PlayStation and Sony had on the development of the game. So it's so obviously Santa Monica is already Sony owned, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. But they they one of the head guys of Sony went to see God of War in progress, and he was like, "This sucks. Make it better right now." <laughs> you know. So <laughs> like, whereas it, it makes you wonder like if he didn't do that. 
like would God of War have been anywhere near of as good as it was when it released? You know, that's the well, and that's, that's the, the question. That's the strength of the PlayStation brand, and I've said this numerous times: is that the thing I respect most about Sony is that with their IP, they're like, no, let, let they invest in it. They, they they'll, they'll delay it. They'll that you know they have patience, right? Because I think they know the pedigree and what people expect from their lineup and that's not always the case for each ip but i know for something like you look at god of war you look at last of us 2 you look at these games it's like yeah like i oh yeah people want to play them but no like they they'll be playing when they're ready and yeah and that's the strength of sony being you know and having the position it has if it was mm -hmm. the underdog it's like okay well, we just got to get this out and go on to the next because we can't just keep throwing money at this but they know that it's not just going to be a system seller it's going to be a bookmark a part of the conversation that for generations people will, will play and as they've evolved from ps4 into ps5 with the with better mindsets regarding backwards compatibility that library becomes more important because it's yeah. like yeah like it's digital we don't have to keep this stocked on a shelf anymore you can and then we'll see it more with streaming and and uh, as the technology just evolves over the next decade it brings me to kind of a, like an important question um as it relates to like series x and, and ps5 uh, a couple things like it seems like microsoft does not seem interested in selling series x's like uh they're like yeah like they're going to make a powerful console but it's they're going to release their games on the current gen next gen and pc and then we've mm -hmm. got more playstation announcements talking about more games potentially coming to pc that it's rumor it's not officially announced but like a lot of playstation i know diehards seem upset that their games might be playable on pc and maybe even xbox to an extent we know, like, um, for a fact that uh, the show, the baseball game, is going to become a multi-platform. And PlayStation makes the best egg-gun baseball game. Like, they just hands down have made the best baseball game. And I'm thrilled that I could be able to play that on Xbox. Not 2020, but 2021. And yeah. um, is it, like, how do you feel in that regards? Like, should consoles in the next, you know, 10 years still have exclusives or should these maybe evolve to a timed exclusive or is PC has PC one without even firing a shot? <laughs> um, it kind of depends. My, I mean, my personal opinion is it's like, just like, you know, you have each other generation, like CDs, they don't exist anymore. Right. DVDs basically nearly don't exist anymore. And now we have Blu-ray and like, I think eventually even Blu-rays one cause you said it's all digital. So everything yeah. will be down. But then it will then reduce the need for them even to be consoles, unless they're like the Nintendo Switch, which is handheld, um, and you can take that out and about with you. So because I feel like, because uh, I, I know that you've done a lot of work with uh, Google Stadia, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the sort of streaming platforms. Now, they are very heavily reliant on the quality of the internet you have. Hands that, down. That's the unfortunate truth of them. Yeah. So, but in the future, like you'll probably everyone will be walking around with like 6g they'll have like a gigabit connection well to fi 5g gets you two gigs and yeah. that's a lot of, like when you look at the, the 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 down and up like 5g takes you to two gig territory on a mobile device um yeah. and that that's and so not outside of gaming like the implications on industry is massive that's that's what's preventing a full automation of our truck fleet in the united yeah. states like we trucks are driving themselves and the real kickover is once it goes 5G, because just like with a drone, with an automated truck, they can't handle ice on the road. And so what we're planning on doing is beaming in drivers tele remotely to handle ice. And, you yeah. know, cool. Got it. We can do that. We don't need somebody on the road anymore. And so just like that, like we're on the verge of this entire economic transformation uh, worldwide due to it, just the investment in technology and so people make a make note of like oh my internet sucks here today it does you know yeah. uh, i'm on gig internet and you know that's awesome but like you talk about remote areas it's like as they roll out 5g which doesn't require lines to be run like mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're like talking about two gigs up and down yeah you know like streaming right now requires 35 megs so <laughs> like yeah. the quality of that it will be able to to scale and actually, the benefit in my where I stay, and I know a lot of people, like, they worry about this future, rightfully so. There's lots of things that, as gamers, we have to fight for the our rights. Otherwise, companies can and, and will, if we give them rope, they, they can and will run away with it. We will find ourselves, like, you know, like, oh, no, like, I wish I could play games, but I, 
you know, like they, they put a lien, like they canceled my membership because of whatever. Um, yeah. But essentially what you'll, what you'll see is that there'll still be a console. There'll still be a PC market. It will become super niche. It will also become very high end. And what will yeah. happen is as a developer, like you can afford it. You can afford it. Let's say like you, you got your five grand PC. Great. I, I, okay. I got one here at home, but what about the kid down the street? Like he, you know, he, he can't, but developers can make all games at a, like now at a five grand PC or a 10 grand PC because of that kid down the street, it's free. He just streams the game. He just buys the game and he can stream it because he's yeah. got the, as long, you know, he's got the internet. And this again is a, you know, I don't see this happening mass adoption for at least five years to 10. Like when we're coming into the 2030s, like that's when people will be like, why should I pay a thousand dollars for the next PlayStation when I can stream all those games? You know, it's like, okay, let me just do that because that's, and then developers don't have to sit here and be shackled by like, well, we have to make the console $400. Like yeah. if you have to make the console $400, like what, what leap is the, is the PS6? What leap mm -hmm. is that that they that they can take and take a bath on it? They want companies won't have to take the bath. They can say just stream it, or if you yeah. want the PS6, is like it is a grand. Like uh, you can you can have that option too if that's what you prefer. But you know that's that's the transition. It, in my mind, it raises the tide, but it's a hard sell to make right now because it is so such a change. Like hey, you don't need the system in your house. Wait a minute, this is how it's always been. You know, like I'm com like I'm comfortable with that. My kids won't know it. Like it's same thing with Temtem. I was telling Chris the other day, I was like, if Pokemon doesn't rise to the occasion and put out a Pokemon MMO, what are my kids playing with me in five years? They'll probably yeah. be playing Temtem and not Pokemon because they'll be on, I'll be on console. They'll be on the switch and we'll be mm -hmm. over here and we're all going to be playing this world. And the next generation grows up and says, Poke what? <laughs> you know, yeah. but that's, I mean, Pokemon still has plenty of IP value. But there is a time limit on it. I don't know what that what it, that is now. It's the reason yeah. why they, Nintendo finally started making mobile games is because they realized they can only sell nostalgia so much, and that nostalgia market is aging. <laughs> and yeah. eventually, you know, like they're oh well, there's nobody who played Nintendo games because you weren't selling systems, and you weren't on mobile. Everybody else was yeah. anyway. Yeah, but going back to the yeah. point of uh, the like, I I think Xbox. Like there will always be enthusiasts, you know. There's people who have just bought like an RTX 20 Ti. Yeah. They will buy the the 3000 RTX the the day it launches, yeah. even though they just spent a grand on the oh, 28. Yeah. Hands down. So and Xbox Series X, same thing. Like the the people will buy it the second it launches. If they release an X squared, you know, five months later, people will buy that. You know, so th they will always be able to sell. But I, I do feel that the, the long-term potential is in, let's say my guess is 10 to 20 years, that the streaming services like Stadia or GeForce Now or whatever mm. will eventually just make it that it's almost, like you say, it's silly to buy a console. Like, why spend all this money on a console yeah. unless it comes preloaded with, like, 50 games or something like that? Yeah, so, that's there's a market there, too. You know, it's just like, yeah, here you go. Go, go yeah. nuts. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I use GeForce now, and mm -hmm. I, I I really like it. It's really the the concept is really cool. Because like, fine, right now my PC is a beast. So my I've got an RTX twenty eighty and all the nice. rest of it. But my old PC, I had a nine hundred and seventy and a really ancient CPU. Mm -hmm. So it didn't play all the recent games really well. So uh, I was using GeForce now, mm -hmm. and it was it was running really well. And I I even made a review to say that because some people worried about lag. Yeah. And I said no, the lag is so low. You can even play shooters. Yeah. On GeForce. That's, that's that what, crazy. that's what changed it for me. Like I was playing, yeah. I've been like, I do shadow PC as well. And so I played destiny and gears five and done competitive stuff like that and been doing great. And yeah. that's where I was like, okay, like the, the proof of concept works. The question is the infrastructure. Yeah. And for me, the big, the big seller, like you're talking about GeForce. Like, I don't know if you tried this cause you said you like, you now have a monster bike thing. I, I had a little laptop. I still do. It's mm -hmm. not a gaming machine. I'm, I'm running Gears 5 Ultra Settings, doesn't even touch my battery. Wow. And I'm just downstairs, just on the laptop, playing Gears 5, having a blast and going, the laptop doesn't even get hot. Like, it's just, yeah. and like, I'm done. All right, close. Laptop was, like, cold as up. Like, it's like, right, I was just kind of here open. I'm like, I don't know what I was, if I was doing anything. And, it, yeah. and so I was like, this is, this is a revolution. You know, this is the start of it. Like, the time, whatever that time ticks over, that that's what I'm like, oh man, people are going to love this 
But just like with anything, it's scary because it's like, what do you mean I don't? What do you mean? <laughs> yes. yeah. Like what the GeForce thing? Like uh, what does that mean? Like, but the strange like GeForce, you own your games on Steam, right? Yeah, yeah. The ownership thing, I think, is where people are real concerned because if Stadia shut it down today, mm -hmm. it sucks to be you who spent money on it. You know, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's just one of those. It's one of those things. We'll see what happens with time. But I'm I'm I am ready for the idea of consoles disappearing. But whether they will or not in the next 10, 20 years, we'll see. But probably not. But I think <laughs> yeah. that the amount of gap between them being released is going to increase. So, like, fine, we're about to get PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, but we're probably not going to get PlayStation 6 for 10 years. That yeah, makes sense. That. that makes Well, especially because if they're able to increase and, and, and rely on the cloud more. That's why I said, like, people are like, oh, Stadia. It's like, yeah, it's, it's ready to compete against the Series X and PS5. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, all right, you got the internet. Boom. Did it cost you anything? No, yeah. like it just it was, it was done, um, and that's the th that's the strength of that versus like that of the like uh, Shadow for me is that oh driver updates like okay when Gears Five came out I had to do updates I had to update the graphics driver like it is a PC in the cloud, uh, you know yeah. and I'm like okay, <laughs> and so like it'll be interesting to see how that 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 plays out but yeah you're right like we don't I have like I don't know when that when that day comes. You know, mm -hmm. it's gonna be interesting to see. I um on the on the shadow and on the GeForce like so uh, you've been using that for ha GeForce for how long now? Um, probably just under a year. Yeah, roughly. Nice. Yeah, but I haven't needed to use it as much since I got this PC. Uh, right. I like just playing things locally because it just looks amazing. But yeah, you know, I, 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 that's the second they announced the beta, I was in like straight away. So uh, and then I didn't look at Google Stadia. Because I already have GeForce Now, so and right. GeForce Now is free. Yeah. So like, Stadia why, why is, is a glorified beta. Like it is hands down a glorified beta. And, I, and the, the only thing, like my, my number one complaint about it is, like in the ads, like it's like we have the games you're looking for, and it's like some guy, and I'm like, no, they don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, all right, like it's so fast to get into a game. It is my preferred way to like when I play Destiny to jump on and play Destiny that way because it's legit just incredibly fast for me to do that uh even faster than playing it on pc i'm like oh i am in i'm there um but right now the problem is spent from a matchmaking perspective is because of the volume the, like it needs crossplay. stadia is right now is this walled off garden and it's so isolating and then beyond that like there's no 14 there's no uh games that i'm playing uh, you know like new world like none of these things especially like that are announced are like coming to stadia and i'm like well you got a lot of work to do, Google, just like you got to do in, Go in YouTube gaming. <laughs> like, like yeah. here's the list. Get to work. Yeah. But Go ahead. the thing is with, with all of these things is like, because uh, Google, they need time. They're, they're going to need years to perfect Stadia and also YouTube gaming and so on. Mm -hmm. But there will be a time in the future when all of this stuff will just be, oh, do you remember how bad it used to be? Yeah. Right? Like, we'll be like, back in my day, like YouTube gaming, like, what, what, you know. Back in Final Fantasy 14 1.0. Like, <laughs> yeah exactly yeah that's all it's going to turn into in the in the future like but like in like that's just the transition we're going through now is that this sort of industry is still emerging the streaming services but yeah in the future it'll just be a given so um it'll be expected like if anything like when when i was in school like kids got in trouble in class if they were caught playing snake on their mobile during class whereas in the future it'll probably be like oh my god he was playing final fantasy 20 on his on his like you know smartphone you know and he managed to cheat on all of his exams because of his hidden eyeglass or whatever you know that's how technology is going to go yeah but um and i'm sure to us we're going to be looking at that like oh you know like it, it's almost like the way the previous generation looked at vcrs you know there was kind of like oh what's this i don't know how to use my vcr even though it's like two parts on. Mm -hmm. but like um you know that that's all it's going to turn into in the future but the um when it comes to microsoft and like you said nintendo all of them nintendo sony and um microsoft competition is healthy yeah. in all mediums youtube competing with twitch is basically google versus amazon healthy you know and then um so i i think the competition is great whether we'll have a fourth one come along when it comes to the consoles who knows mm. which company could possibly come in like to compete against Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo, Amazon. Right. Yeah, well, who knows if they'll even ever bother? Right. So that's the thing. They they already make so much money from other things. So right. like, do they need to? It's like, for example, Valve. Like, obviously, Valve are very famous for Half Life. Yeah. But 
they don't really care about Half-Life much anymore because they have Steam. Mm. You know, Steam already makes them billions of dollars. So why would they need to carry on the Half-Life series? I, I know they're already making that Half-Life VR game. Well, they're doing that uh, to also push VR. You know, because yeah. they want to sit here and say, like, this is the VR experience that we want, and then this is what we want to deliver to players. And if that's something that gets a lot of people into VR, like, oh, I'm all for it. Like, let's make it happen. Um, I'm not keen on VR, namely because from a content creator, creation and a parent perspective, it doesn't actually fit. I have a, I have, I have VR, and mm-hmm. I, I use it so little that I, and I go, I wish I had more opportunity to use it, and I wish I got the Quest that would be portable. Because mm-hmm. it, and it literally is, it has nothing to do with anti VR. You know, it's like at all. It's man, I it this doesn't fit my current life. Yeah. And I, if yeah. if I, it was portable, it would. And I was like, dang it, I invested in the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I'm 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 hopeful that they can like just change the game because it's just it's so legit fascinating uh, as yeah. a technology. But go ahead. But I was saying about VR is that it doesn't really work for me because you see I wear glasses. Oh yeah. So um, I've worn I've worn a VR headset before and it was it was inter- It's fascinating. You put it on and then mm-hmm. suddenly you're like in a completely different place. Yeah. But like obviously with my glasses, it's 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 not good for me. It gives yeah. me headaches. It gives me so many things, um, and like motion sickness. So um, I I don't know if they'll ever release prescription VR headsets. <laughs> you know, it's not likely. But you know, who knows? We'll we'll see. But um, that I I don't really like. Uh, VR, like, to be honest, I actually really like mobile games. You know, I said I've mm. been covering a lot of them. I'm not covering them just for the sake of making videos. Right. I'm really, really enjoying them. But the only reason I'm really enjoying them is because I actually do play them on my PC. So I'm using an emulator called Memu yeah. to do that. Because I, if I was, because I tried to like play some of, I was, I was playing Final Fantasy 15 Pocket Edition. I was trying to stream it from my ex, from my iPhone X. But like, it, it works really well on the iPhone. But then. You, you play for an hour and the battery's gone. Mm-hmm. So that's the problem. Whereas when you're using an emulator, you can play all day. And the apps are really, really well made. I mean, some of them are overly monetized. So that's the problem. It's like, <laughs> you know, you do half an hour of content and then it's like, okay, pay more if you want to do another half hour today or yeah. wait, you know. So, but a lot of games, like, especially now, because the Black Desert Mobile is so good. Like, it's the best, um, like app i've ever played by far wow it's like as an actual mmo on your phone yeah so like, i even showed it to my my sister and she was like oh my god like really because it's is it like, integrated I it, like, into a, just black desert or is it se- like a s- whole separate thing it, it's, it's separate it's okay. separate it's not it's not like an extension but it's, it's still based around the black desert like world so it has the same sort of features and so on um but like i would say like don't ignore the mobile games it's a it's a massive thing like because i'm still playing apps every day they're very very fun they're very addicting Mm -hmm. um because i think with with um the they're sort of like the balancing so with with a mobile app they have to accomplish so much on such a small screen they're very limited in what they can do so they have to design it really well whereas when you have these consoles going for like 8k resolution 120 fps blah, blah 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 then the focus might then become on the environments and the textures rather than the playability. Mm-hmm. And that's why, for example, with Nintendo, with the Switch, they went backwards. They said, we're not making a console that will compete with PlayStation and Xbox. We're making a basic glorified mobile mm-hmm. because um, simply we care about the games being fun, not about them being the best looking. Yeah, And that, that's, that's, the, that's always a balancing act. So obviously Sony and Microsoft are locked in their war of we have the most powerful console, they have the most beautiful graphics, blah, blah, blah. And Nintendo comes along with, like, well, whatever, we're, we're focused on the fun. Oh, look, the Switch is probably outselling like both of them or something. You know, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I, but, but, but the Switch is doing incredibly well. And in terms of mobile devices, there's nothing that even comes close to the Switch. Mm-hmm. You know, like when it, when it came out, at least in London, UK, like unless you pre-ordered, you can't buy one. You couldn't buy one for months, even like so. Like I remember one of my coworkers; he had to wait a good three, four months before he was able to get his hands on one because yeah. the demand was that high. So um, yeah, so it's it's always the balancing act. But like I said, when it comes to the mobile games, um, like if you want to play them on your PC, just get an emulator. I, I recommend Memu. Like there's Blue Stacks. There's there's so many different emulators you can Nox you, that you can try and and play. So and the good thing is as well. A lot of the developers of the mobile apps, they know obviously that everyone's using emulators. So like you have a game like PUBG Mobile. It's mm-hmm. one of the biggest mobile games like in the world. So like it's it's 
popular in the West, but it's very popular everywhere else. So yeah. that's why it's always way up the rankings. And um, like, it will detect the second it detects an emulator. So, okay, you're using an emulator, therefore we're only going to queue you against other emulator Emulators. players. Yeah. So, like, just so you're not basically with keyboard and mouse going against people who are trying to do it on like a touchscreen. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm the like, best like, in this game. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like, like let me get headshots from like a thousand meters, and the other people are like, uh, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, like, they, they can't even see you. So, but um, yeah, I, I would say as well, don't um, don't underestimate the mobile games. Will do. So, Will like, do. <laughs> so, uh, me through like we, we went over a little over time, but I really was enjoying the conversation itself. Uh, where can people find you? Like, are, are you working on anything uh, that you're excited to, to share? And if not, no worries. But where can people find you? Uh, what you got going on? Yeah. So, um, uh, primarily these days, you'll find me on YouTube. So, youtube.com slash Mithri, M I T H R I E. So, and on there, every single day, I'm releasing a what is video where I give a brief introduction about a game series or franchise which i'm very interested in that i feel that is worth checking out and i try and do a mix between current games which are, are let's say about to come out or games which have already come out but are incredibly famous and everyone should play them so i try and keep the balance between there you can also find me at twitch.tv slash mifri as well i'm a twitch partner and uh but mostly on youtube and you can also join my discord so discord.gg slash mifri as well and um, if you have any questions, any insight or feedback, feel free to contact me and let me know. I, I do re reply to nearly every comment on my channel, which takes a lot of work. But uh, <laughs> I, because I do this full time, I dedicate time to doing that every single day. So, um, yeah, so that's where people can find me if they want to talk to me. So for uh, anybody watching this or listening to this, we'll have all the links uh, to all his uh, ways that you can follow him on YouTube, on uh, on Twitter, on Twitch, and uh, for his Discord in the, the description of this video or podcast, so you guys can go check that out. And I encourage you to do so. Uh, like I said, he's got a massive catalog of a lot of variety of games, and it's uh, truly quite impressive. And he, and like I said at the beginning and the top of the show, uh, you taught me how uh, to originally make money in Final Fantasy XIV. There were so many things you were diving into. I was like, what is this? So it was really, that's how I discovered you, and I thank you for putting out that content. Um, yeah. way back uh, in the day. So uh, for me, this and for work to game my name is Brian. You can find us on YouTube, Twitch, Mixer, Twitter, uh, pretty much like on all the different platforms. We stream Monday nights, and we're, we've got some plans. Uh, we just spun up a kind of a, on YouTube, because I like streaming over on YouTube, but the algorithm is kind of is kind of strange, so we're uh, putting together a new channel called Work to Play, and we've got, uh, we're going to be doing our streaming over there, and so we've kind of been uh, doing that. Chris has been streaming Temtem before his vacation, and uh, we've got all kinds of stuff that we're planning on uh, putting up over on that channel as well. So uh, you can find us pretty much anywhere, like how you spell it, with a two or a T-O. Um, our last podcast was with Freelancer Codex, talking about the, the state of Anthem then versus now, uh, which is a really cool podcast to kind of go over, especially with a game. Uh, and it's true, like it kind of ties into what Me3 was saying, like as long as the developers are listening and they're putting in the work, like things can happen. If they don't, if they don't care, then it's like, yeah, that's kind of when games just go away. Um, but it do, doesn't appear like that cat has died yet. So we'll yeah. see what happens with Anthem in 2020. And our next podcast is with Nerd Slayer. Uh, we've got them coming on talking about all kinds of fun video games and more. So we'll be back with them uh, next week here on uh, Twitch and, and more. So we've got a lot of great stuff coming at you guys in 2020. Uh, Me3, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, chat, for hanging out with us. Thank you, anybody watching this. Uh, in the archive or in the audio form. Um, but we'll go ahead and say goodbye. <laughs> uh, usually we do a sign off where it's like we just kind of go around Robin. We let the guests kind of like catch on to the, the round Robin-ness. But without Chris here, it'd just feel a little, feel a little awkward. We'd be like, I'm just waiting for me three to say something. But <laughs> yeah. um, again, thanks me three. Thanks chat. I uh, love you guys very much. And we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye guys.